जॉन के सिंगापुर से to try out the system whenever you like. I'm happy yeah, to start hi. sharing uh, sharing content, sharing screen. Yeah, this is Jagannath. This is Jagannath Mollik. Yeah. Okay, hi, hi, how are you? Yeah, good. Very how good. are you? I'm very good, yeah. thanks. Thank you for, for being part of all this and allowing me to, to speak to uh, speak to the bank. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. No, no, no. My great pleasure. Thank you. We'll start by 11.30. Uh, sorry, say again? We'll start by 11.30. Just another uh, four minutes. Yeah, I'm happy to, you know, because, uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I'm all ready to go, so, you know, I can share screen whenever you like. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I know that, you know, there's going to be a, a, the, a welcome by the chief economist, I think. Yeah, so I'm happy to wait. So no worries. Uh, is anyone else seeing our conversation now? Can I? Do you want me to try the share screen? Yeah, it's it's, it's clear. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's clear. It, yeah, you can share. You can share. You can share your screen. Please share. How does that look? Yes, yes, it's great. Looks okay. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, I just turned it off again, so just whenever you're ready. Yes. Excellent. How is how is weather in Singapore? Oh, everything, you know, it's 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 fine. It's actually a little bit cooler than usual. How is it in Mumbai? Everything okay? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's normal. Yeah, it's, no, it's the Cal weather is Calcutta, yeah. Oh yeah, in Calcutta. Sorry. Because I was yeah. reading up on the I was reading on the internet. And uh, I thought that Mumbai was where the the headquarters was. Yes, right, right, right. Ah, but you are in Calcutta. Yes, yes. And is the is the event there being held in Calcutta or Mumbai? The, the, the institute is yeah. The institute is in Calcutta. Yeah. Ah, I see. I see. Part of Apologies, history, uh, sorry, I, I misread then. As a training institution, so ah, it's I part see. of history. I see. I see. Excellent. Yeah, no, it's a it's a very impressive uh, organization. Uh, so it's very good. Yeah. Hello, someone else has just come in. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, it's our chief economist as well as director. Hello. Yeah, they will be joining. Yeah. I see. Excellent. Good morning, Ghosh, sir. Good morning, Ghosh, sir. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I think. 
think we'll start. Did the sir are you there? Yeah. Yeah, director sir, can you have you on the screen? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Good, good morning, uh, professor, and good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning. Good to see you, sir. <laughs> really good. So, yeah. we'll, so we'll proceed. Yeah. Well, distinguished dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. I am Dr. Jagannath Malik the coordinator of the lecture series and also moderator of today's lecture on economics and international systems. First of all, on the behalf of State Bank Institute of Leadership, I warmly welcome our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Danny Kwa from National University of Singapore and Dr. and Dr. Somikant Ghosh, the Group Chief Economic Advisor, Economic Research Department, State Bank of India and other dignitaries and participants from Singapore, Russia, UK and other countries. About today's lecture, we know how COVID-19 has hurt the global economy, including India. It has affected everyone, the rich, the poor, the advanced country economies, the emerging economies, developing economies, the manufacturing, the services, although the magnitude of impact varies. So we are having discussion on these issues, starting from our lecture on Japanese business and MNCs in India in the pandemic by Professor Sato from Kobe University, Japan. Then uh, on the long run economic growth in the pandemic in Russia by the expert from Higher School of Economics, National Research University, Moscow. And then on capacity utilization in Switzerland and India by K of Swiss Economic Institute, Switzerland, and the export from Reserve Bank of India. And then on state of global economy in the post pandemic by the export from Investor Groningen, Netherlands. In these lectures, our focus was on demand side factors as the reason for the slowdown in economic growth in India and other countries in this pandemic. However, in the last lecture, we also especially focus on the supply side factors, particularly how the supply chain is disrupted due to this pandemic which was discussed by Dr. Amitandu Palit. I think Professor Danikwa may be knowing. He is from ISIS, Institute for Studies in Southeastern Studies from NAUS, National University of Singapore. Besides COVID-19, there are many other things going on in the, in the global economy, such as financial, that is finalization of Brexit deal and establishment of RISEP, regional conferences, economic partnership, and changing political leadership in the most powerful country like USA. And at the same time also, shifting or relocating of American and Japanese companies from China and trade and tariff war of China with the USA, Australia, and other countries. Of course, some of the international economic relations are also driven by the geopolitical relations. In other words, the notion of anti-globalization has been emerging across the world from USA, Europe, within Asia, Africa, and Australia, particularly their protest against some of the countries' method of business, investment, and trade. Further, there is the rise of a rise in the GVCs, global value chains, that put new challenges in front of economists and policymakers. And uh, as pointed out by Richard Baldwin and Javier Lopez Gunjan Lech, the main challenge lies in prescribing new policy for the smooth functioning of GVCs, notably by improving the laws and disciplines for the international trade investment or service nexus, and to fail the distribution of outcome among the stakeholders. In this lecture, we'll have a detailed discussion on these issues by our guest speaker, Professor Daniqua, mainly to analyze the merits and demerits of the present international ecosystem but to address the above issues with relation to the global economic integration. Right. So, friends, this is the sixth lecture of the series. I take this opportunity to give a big thank to our participants, speakers, and experts in our events. And for this, we are also very thankful to our director, Mr. Sarasmar Potnak, sir, for his active support 
for the lecture series. The sequence of the sequence of today's event as follows: the opening remarks by our director and then welcome address by Dr. Sumikant Ghosh, followed by the presentation by Professor Dani, and then we have questions and answer session. Before I invite our director, allow me to say a few words about him. He is general manager and director of SBIL. He is a law graduate from Delhi University. He has done his MBA in HR and is also a certified associate of the Indian Institute of Banking and Finance. He has an illustrious career in banking, about 33 years. He's having varied experiences in retail and HR, as well as overall exposure to the bank system. He had joined the SBI in 1987 as a professional officer. He has served as chief manager in learning and development, regional manager, circle development officer, Ahmedabad Circle Gujarat, and then the DGM, Bodhadara Ahmedabad Circle Gujarat. So I request you, sir, to deliver the opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jagannath, and uh, thank you very much for taking forward this uh, series of Beyond Boundaries of SBIL. But at the outset, I welcome Professor Denis Kaur. That's a, it's a great uh, privilege for uh, SBIL. We are having you at, on our board and uh, Chief General Manager uh, Dr. Shomyo Kanti Ghos, our Group Chief Economic Advisor for the whole bank, State Bank of India. At the outset, uh, before I touch upon the uh, lecture series, something since it's an international lecture series, I'd like to place what State Bank stands for. It has having a legacy of more than 200 years, precisely 215 years, this great organization is on. And with a assets value as in present day is $590 billion. Furthermore, if it stands in the Fortune Global Company, it enlisted 236 out of 500. So far as the one of the biggest corporations so far India is concerned. In Pan World, it is 236th. And 22,141 branches, including 200 plus branches overseas in 32 countries. And with a quarter million of competent employees, and SBI provided a full plethora of banking service to 449 million customers. You can count it could be more than so small countries so far the population is concerned. This background has been there because of its consistency and it is connecting with the roots. And with this background, not only it's the only the banking uh, financial services uh, the state bank is known for, it has got more than 50 odd treatment uh, learning center across the country. Apart from that, there are six domain specific Apex Training Institute. And in this regard, this institute has come into break in 2017. The chairman and the competent authority, they have thought State Bank in, in, uh, Institute of Leadership should be constituted. Basically, primary is, uh, idea is to groom, groom the future leadership in the VFI sector. Not only that, and to ensure that there should be academic excellence, as, and there should be a complete outside domain where the research and other areas also state bank can touch upon, apart from the banking services per se. In this background, we are focused and we have been in the marching ahead with the specific goals. But COVID-19 has again, this unprecedented and unforeseen circumstances has thought it in a beyond proportion. For the first time, SBL has also in order to make it relevant during these difficult times, we had an approach of 360 degree. This concept has been emphasized by our research fellow, Mr. Jag Dr. Jagannath Malli, and we have given a go-ahead. And in this background, right now we are in front of you. This global economic series, now we have traveled already all five countries, whether it's Japan, Russia, Switzerland, Netherlands, Singapore. What I'm trying to say, relevant topic and entire over the globe, we are trying to connect. Eminent people are there. They share their ideas. We enable this platform so that people can connect. They also envisage how the State Bank of India can also think in a different realms, or it can think in a different way forward, which normally we won't have if COVID-19 won't have been there. So with this background, Professor, we are in front of you. 
Regarding COVID-19, the way it has created an impact, you can un always understand the entire global economy, whether it's a developed country, whether it's a developed countries. Both the, everyone has been affected. When we think of the medical developed country like European countries, America, they have been also devastated with their advanced health structure. Still, they couldn't cope with the situation. But think of the situation. It has affected not only the tangible, it has affected the intangible assets also. People emotionally they, uh, disturbed, psychologically confined to this, this lockdown and other things also has created so much of pressure in emotional and economic uh, uh, areas, it is beyond purpose. It cannot be deciphered. In the meantime, the, the, the change of guards, especially in America, it has created also huge impact so far as the prospect of uh, international relation is concerned. Furthermore, two aspect is also creating an issue so far as the topic you are going to go ahead. That is, one is the Brexit deal, whether it is going to finalize between Britain and the European Union. And RCEP, again, USA and India are not there. Especially the trust deficit with China is also a major factor so far as the pan entire world is concerned. Whether it's America, whether it's India, whether it's Vietnam, Philippines, the South China issue, the Hong Kong issue, the Taiwan, everywhere, the Nepal, everywhere. So whether along with the COVID, all these things are going to have an impact, that is, it is in the public domain. So. Here in India, after the lockdown, I'll tell you MSME, which is the real growth engine so far as a developing country like us, we have been affected tremendously. Basically, before the COVID-19, there are two major issues so far as the world was concerned. One was to fight against hunger, and the second one was to take care of management of climate change. But one COVID-19, it has given a different perspective altogether. But this perspective has to be dealt or this perspective has to be made or this perspective has to undermine only when eminent people are going to share their thoughts and they are going to the, your views can be put across the globe so that people can get the different ideas how to deal with the difficult times how to deal with the unfortunate so with this background professor you are with us and we feel privileged and proud you are there and you have also given time for us we we'll really regards for that. At the same time, a very hearty and humble welcome to you. Whenever you come to India, you have already seen <clears throat> the entire infrastructure of SVIL. Would be privileged to host you here. And that is will be a uh, moment of empowerment for us also. With this, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Jagannath to take it forward. And, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, our Chief Economic Advisor, Dr. Somya Kanthi Ghosh, for being there. I think he was busy, but still he has given time for us. That itself shows the importance entire State Bank is giving for this kind of lecture series. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jagannath. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the opening remark. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, he cannot be with us. He got an uh, urgent meeting, so he, he left. <laughs> so we'll proceed. Well. Thank you, sir, for the open remarks. Really, you have set the tone for the uh, talk by our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Danny Kwa. So now it is my great pleasure to invite Professor Danny to deliver our sixth lecture. About him, he is Lee Ka Singh Professor in Economics and Dean at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. National University of Singapore. He had studied at Princeton University, in Princeton, in Princeton University, and Howard University. His research centers on income inequality and on world order. In his research, he documents the variety of inequality experiences across economies to suggest that a single narrative on inequality is, on, is unlikely to be correct or helpful. On world order, he takes an economic approach to international system studying the supply and demand of world order on the one hand and uh, what international systems the world superpower provide and on the other hand, what world order the global community needs. He uses this to recast analysis of global power shifts, the rise of the East and regional order 
and model of global power relations. He has worked at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology USA, and has a work as a director at London School of Economics and also as the head of Department of Economics, London School of Economics. He is also a member of Malaysia's National Economic Advisory Council. He is also a member of the Spence Stiglitz Commission on Global Economic Transformation. He gave the TEDx talks in 2016, 2014, and 2012. He has about 220 publications into his credit in the top rated journals, including American Economic Review, Review of uh, yeah, uh, European Economic Review, Journal of Economic Growth, Economic Letters, Journal of Political Economy, and Econometrica. He has worked with the renowned economists like Oliver Blanchard from MIT, his book we generally read for in our bachelor's and uh, master level, and also with various experts from University of Warwick, Australian National University, London School of Economics, University of Cambridge, Columbia University, and Professor G. Arvia, who is my friend also. He specializes niche on special economics and special econometrics. So thank you, Professor Danny, for giving your valuable time from your hectic schedule. It's over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Malik, and thank you, Director, for such a warm welcome and introduction. I hope you can hear me all right. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, very good. Um, I, you know, as, as, as suggested, actually, you know, I felt very humbled when I heard, you know, Dr. Malik and your Director go through the list of issues here because it seemed to me that you're already covering all the issues that I wanted to talk about and, and doing it much better then I will, in, in my so humble way, I will try and, and fill in some of the gaps in, in what the director and what Dr. Malik has already said. And in going through this, what, I, what, what at the end of it, what I'd like to do is to make sure that I get the audience here to tell me how, how you, the audience, see the fit of the Indian nation, of your bank into the picture of the international system and the international economic and financial system that I will be describing in the next you know, 30, 45 minutes or so. The, in going through this, COVID-19 will, of course, as already suggested, and in fact, as, as, as highlighted by the series of lectures that I'm, I'm so honored to be part of, COVID-19 will figure importantly in what I will say, nothing of the scale of COVID-19, 70 million people infected, 1.6 million uh, deaths before their time. You know, nothing could happen in the world without COVID-19 being so critical, so important, so central in the way we should be thinking about the way forwards. But also in my, in my presentation on economics and the international system, I also want to point out that, that what I want to draw on is that even if we hadn't had COVID-19, the world at the beginning of 2020 was already having to deal with several large shocks to the system. I mean, the first of these, the harrowing geostrategic rivalry, as was already referred to, between the United States and China, and with other nations like yours and mine, drawn into the rivalry, not always willingly, in different ways. Second, in every nation, there had already been rising social disquiet on domestic issues, income inequality, fears of social stagnation, the failure of social mobility. Third, across the world, there was already an increasing disdain for science and expertise. One with the you know, sort of anti-vax movement in the United States, vaccine hesitancy around the world and in Europe especially, and an and idea that uh, you know, ordinary people, their homespun wisdom, their homespun observations matched the hard-won expertise of scientists, you know, there was there was viewed to be this idea that we had had enough of experts, and that was I thought very dangerous to to science. It was threatening 400 years of scientific progress since the age of reason. And then, of course, fourthly, 
the rise of nationalist populism and the and a deglobalization around the world and a, 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 a movement by many nations of sort of withdrawing from the international system. So I find all, I found all of that was already tricky. And then COVID-19 came on top of that. And I want to argue as I go through my, my presentation that COVID-19 accelerated many of these changes that we're already seeing. And it's bringing the world to a very dangerous point. COVID-19 by itself would have already been terrible, shaking up the economy, uh, uh, actually threatening all our health systems, killing significant chunks of humanity, but it accelerated so many of these other things that were undermining world order. So when I say international system going forwards, when I say world order going forwards, I will use these interchangeably. And what I mean by them, what I mean by world order, what I mean by international system, is that it's the set of international rules that determine relationships between nations. It is the norms, the modalities by which nations operate on the international landscape. Some people think of it as the liberal rules-based order. Some people think of it as the American century. Some people think of it as American-centric unipolarity. Others, we in Asia, think of it as the rise of Asia. In the hands of my colleague, Kishore Mabubani, is emerging as the Asian century. Now, all of this, I'm going to refer to as just world order. And world order matters to us, whether we are economists like uh, Dr. Malik or myself, or whether we are academics, or whether we're bankers, like so many of you in the audience are. It matters to us because world order is the architecture within which all of us operate when our economy, Singapore, India, China, the United States, Great Britain, when whichever economy we're most engaged with, engages with the rest of the world. That is the architecture, the rules of the game by which our nation, our economy, engages with the world. And so if world order changes, those rules change. Now, let me very quickly say, when I referred to some of these terminologies, the American century, um, you know, a US-centered world power, for many of us, outside the traditional transatlantic centers of power, world order is not something we're very comfortable with. Often, for many of us in emerging nations, in emerging Asia, we say that world order is a system constructed by the rich, mostly to benefit the rich. Or we say it's a system that's been designed to keep down the poor. Why else is it that IMF and World Bank have traditionally had as their chiefs, their chief executives, someone always from just the United States or always from Europe? Yeah, the chief economist can come from India. Their chief economists can come from, from, from China, but the chief executives remain so transatlantic centered. Now, in that view, when we think about world order as being something to keep down the poor, to keep the rich, to, to continue to benefit the rich, we would argue that world order is not a good thing. We want to change it to something else. Now, part of my point here this afternoon or this morning is to argue that actually my view of world order is not that. I want to argue that world order has actually done a lot of good in the world. And in this, of course, you know, sometimes when I talk to, to development economists or, or some of my friends that are a bit more, more left oriented, they get quite irritated at me because they say, no, 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 no. world order was something that's been designed by the rich to benefit the rich. I want to argue the opposite. But actually, for the point that I want to get to, and for the current state of the world, actually, it doesn't matter whether I am right or my critics are right. Because whether or not we want to tear down the system, whether or not we want to preserve it, the point is the 
original designer of the system, the nations at the center of the system, the nations that are supposed to be protecting that system, they already want to do away with it. Trump's America undermining the international system is just one example. But I'm going to argue that actually the disquiet from the center about the international system is actually more pervasive than just Trump. So whether you agree with my characterization of the international system or whether you don't, if you it doesn't actually matter for the point I want to get to, which is to try and use economics to think about how you and I might redesign the system. If you disagree with whether I think with that, I think the current system has done good, then you're just going to agree with me even more when I say we want a new system. If you agree that I think that with what I think that the old system was good, then you and I will have to give it up grudgingly, but we will have to give it up anyway because the people who architecture that system, the people who are preserving that system, don't want to keep it anymore. So what I mean is this. When I think about the current system, sometimes I think we think of it as a vertical hierarchy. I hope you can see the, the screen that I've shared. On the upper left side, as you look at that screen, there is a vertical linear hierarchy where there's a ranking of nations. There's a number one top nation. Most people think of as the United States. Not all of us agree, but most people think of it that way. And that the United States is the one, the, the, the number one nation is the leader of the economic system. It is the benevolent, it is the hegemon. Whether you think that benevolent or not, it is the hegemon. That is the one that is central in writing the rules of the game. It monitors the compliance of those rules. It sanctions and punishes those who violate those rules. It might welcome new members to the inner circle or it might exclude others. That top nation in that linear hierarchy is the hegemonic leader of the world order. And what I've just gone through says that everybody, the number one nation itself, the nations at the bottom of the world order, everyone agrees this is no longer viable. We no longer want that linear hierarchy, vertical set the vertical rankings for world order. We want it to change to something else. Now, in this picture that I've given you, for those of you who are, you know, sort of more network systems inclined, you might want to cast your eye to the right side of this picture where I've drawn a potential network of nations. And it is linkages between nations that would determine the new world order. I, I find that model actually quite a good one. But I also think more compelling is the picture at the bottom of the slide, which says that actually the new organizational structure for world order that we want to be thinking about, that you and I, whether in India or Singapore or elsewhere in the world, can be thinking about, about redesigning the international system, is to think about it as a marketplace. So we want to think about there being world order, international systems, different candidate world orders as being things that the marketplace chooses. And in this marketplace, there is an upward sloping supply curve from those who want to provide world order, perhaps the traditional number one nation, perhaps the great powers, the incipient great powers like India, possibly China, other nations, powerful nations in the world, who are alternative providers. They're on the supply side. And on the demand side, there's everybody else in the world. So when I say a marketplace for world order or using economics to think about the international system, it is this picture, the marketplace model that I have in mind. And to be very clear, when I say marketplace here, I don't mean trading in commodities. I don't mean trading in natural resources or manufactured goods. I'm thinking about demand and supply for global leadership, demand and supply for a new world order. And to make sure that I get to the bottom line here, I want to use economics to think about how you and I might redesign the international system. Because that old international system being torn down. 
if you liked it the same way that I liked it, you might say, well, I wish it could go on because it actually did the right thing. We don't have a choice here because the traditional architects of that system no longer want to have it around. So that is what I mean by the economics of the international system. That is what this lecture is about, economics and the international system. So let's continue on this. What do I, what, so when I say, you know, if you build, there, there are three parts to the remaining 30 minutes or so that I've got to, to spend, that I've got to, be, to get to deliver this lecture to you. Uh, first is what, what matters for world order. And for that, I'm just going to go over, that, that's just going to be a summary of what I've just said. Then the, the parts that are, the more substantive parts I want to get to, arc and outcome. The second box here, which is to trace out why I think the old system was good. You don't have to agree, but if you are, uh, you know, possibly indifferent, possibly trying to, to see what the other side might say, you might want to see why I think the old system was good. And it does feed into the third block here, which is new models. And in these new models, we do away with hierarchy, and instead we allow all the nations in the world that are not great powers, not those who would have traditionally sat at the top of that linear ranking, also to have a say in how the international system evolves, also to have a say in how world order needs to, needs to come about. So on the first bit, when I said, you know, uh, what I wanted world order to do, why I thought it was a good thing, here's why I thought it was a good thing. Because traditional world order, in many people's view, was led by a core of nations distributed around the transatlantic axis. Those were the nations, Britain, Western Europe, the United States, that got together in Bretton Woods after the Second World War and wrote the rules of the game for the new international architecture. Bretton Woods led to the United States and Britain being the sort of the leaders, John Maynard Keynes, Harry Dexter White, architecturing the rules of the international financial system. So the world was run, if you, if you, if you buy the, the story that I'm telling in this vertical hierarchy, the traditional system, the world was run by a cluster of nations around the top of that, that vertical ranking who made decisions. That seems grossly unfair. Why do I think that this might potentially have been a good system? Because you see, the bulk of the world is not in the transatlantic region. It is here where you and I are speaking. It is a, a circle that I've drawn here that includes India, includes China, includes all of Southeast Asia. And the reason I've drawn the circle here is because this is the smallest circle that represents, that counts up, that collects together half the world's population, the world's democratic majority. If the old system served, you know, was good for the world in the sense that I thought it was, it is here in this circle that we should have been voicing what decisions were good decisions. But what I want to argue next in the second block is that actually inadvertently, despite the politic, geopolitical center of the world being off in the transatlantic axis, and here the democratic majority of the world, the great fraction of the world's population dealing with common problems that we are all having to deal with in our proximity, poverty, development, uh, corruption, bureaucracy, rules of governance. It is here that there should have been that attention paid. Instead, it was off in the West, transatlantic cluster, that decisions were being made. How can this have been a good thing? Well, I want to argue that actually it was a good thing. And the reason is arc and outcome. Because you see, when Dexter White and Keynes and, and, and the years, the decades that came after constructed the international system, the vision that they constructed was of a truly international economic order. This transatlantic axis thought about what was good for the transatlantic axis, but they also thought 
about how that might benefit the world. So for instance, President Woodrow Wilson in the United States, President Harry Truman, again in the United States, President Richard Nixon in the United States, none of these individuals is considered popular now in the United States. All of them have deep personal failings, but they are among my favorite global economic leaders because they brought for us a vision. What was that vision? It was a vision where there was a world, it was a vision of where the world was of nation states that could deal with each other. It was a vision of nation states that traded and interacted with each other. There were multilateral international laws. This would create an orderly international community. And in these laws, they treated nations as they treated individuals. They respected nations. There was a reign of law based on what Woodrow Wilson referred to as consent of the governed, sustained by the organized opinion of humanity. So Woodrow Wilson, even though he was not successful in convincing Americans to come along with this vision, expressed a vision of how something that was made in the West could still be good for all of humanity. And that what was good in the West sought consent of the governed. In other words, they were meant to be responsive to that democratic majority that I just that I drew a second ago. And let me just very quickly tell you why this succeeded, why in my view this succeeded. And again, if you don't agree with this, that's fine. I'm just building what building up to what I think a good model of the international system ought to be, given that this model, the past model, will no longer be available to us. But if you think this wasn't a good model, put that aside, come with me for the next part of my journey. American unipolarity, whether it was by coincidence or whether it was by design, American-centric unipolarity, a concentration of power at the top of the linear hierarchy, brought the world multilateralism, and it brought along with it big ideas, open global architecture, mutual security. It brought with it an idea of a level playing field. Now, many of us will be cynical. We will say America did not actually deliver a level playing field, and I would be the first to agree with you. I'm talking about the idea of the international system. I'm talking about what happened in practice, although what happened in practice was not all bad either. That was meant to be inclusive and transparency. So what did all this bring? The American century, that linear hierarchy, the transatlantic concentration of geopolitical power, it led to a world where the world's economic center of gravity ran away from the geopolitical center. Now, the world's economic center of gravity is just a metaphor to help us think about where the concentration of economic activity is. The world's economic center of gravity is rushing now towards us. You in Calcutta, the bank in Mumbai, me here in Singapore, the world's economic center of gravity, as depicted in this picture, calculated by me in an earlier research paper, started out in 1980 in the transatlantic, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, exactly as you might expect the geopolitical center might want it. But then it ran away. It ran away towards us from the rise of Asia, from India transforming its economy, growing to become the world's fastest growing large economy. It was brought to us, us by the rise of China, the continued strength of Japan, by the rise of Southeast Asia. If the world's geopolitical leaders centered on the transatlantic axis had been so mean and miserable and did things only for themselves, did things only for the rich, this shift in the world's economic center should not have happened. Let me confirm that with another picture. This is a graph that shows what my uh, colleague and friend Kishore Mabubani in a joint publication, we refer to it as the globalization lift. And in this picture, this picture compares the combined incomes of 170 emerging nations. So at one point early on, Singapore was in it, Malaysia was certainly in it, China was in it, India was in it. It compared the in combined income of these 170 or so emerging nations, developing economies, with the combined income of the G7. And it took that ratio. And what we see is that the flat spot in the early part of this graph says that the combined income 
of the 170 or so emerging nations relative to the combined income of the G7 was 30% and it remained at 30% for decades. In this picture between 1980 and 2000, that ratio remained at only 30%. So this is comparing a huge chunk of the world with the richest seven economies and we outside of the G7 only came to 30% of what the G7 was. But then from 2000, this changed. This ratio began to rise. And by 2015, it had reached parity. The group of emerging nations was in total as rich as the group of the G7. And one might say, well, yeah, but you know, this is 170 nations that compared to seven. All that is true. But there was also the case early on when this group of 170 nations were only 30 percent. So the, 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 the international system that was constructed, linear hierarchy that it was, you know, was one that hugely benefited chunks of the world. Now, this is not to say that everybody in the world benefited from it. There are still deep pockets of poverty across Southeast Asia, across India, in China. Part of this globalization lift still left people behind. But it was a dramatically different world in 2015 than in 1980. And how did this come about? This came about because of vision. Let me go through the rest of this quite quickly. Uh, when when at, the, at the beginning of all this, this globalization lift, at the beginning of the American century, the last seven decades, it didn't come about spontaneously. It came about because leaders, intellectuals, bankers, journalists thought that it would be a good thing. So Henry Luce, who was the editor of Time Life magazine in the United States, began to write articles that made Americans think of themselves as building an international system that would be called the American century. And this American century would be one that was characterized by the thinking and the writings and the speeches of presidents like Harry Truman, who said, yeah, you know what? America won the Second World War. We defeated our enemies, but then we brought them back to the community of nations anyway. We did not bully them the same way that a big bully might have. We ended up bullying some of them, but the vision that was constructed was that we would bring everyone together. So even as American global power became stronger and stronger, larger and larger, cementing America's position at the top of that linear hierarchy, even as all of that happened, America continued to look outwards. And as an example of that, we only have to remind ourselves of what Richard Nixon said in 1967. Remember, the world in 1967 was where you know, India was already a democracy. All of us in Southeast Asia were emerging democracies. We were not what America was worrying about. America was worrying about the Soviet Union in the Cold War, China, a communist state. What did Richard Nixon say? Richard Nixon said, well, democracies are part of our brotherhood of nations. India, Southeast Asia, we're already one family. But we also cannot afford to leave China outside. Because what China will do if it remains outside is it'll nurture its fantasies, cherish its hates, threaten its neighbors. We do not want that to happen. We want to be inclusive because there's no place on this small planet, Nixon wrote, for a billion of arguably its most talented people to live in angry isolation. The vision that was constructed despite the linear hierarchy was that no one should be left to live in angry isolation. Let me finish up this part of it. That world that was constructed, that I said is coming apart now, that you and I need to use economics to try and put back together or build a better version, most writers refer to as liberal internationalism. It was a rules-based order. It was inclusive. It was structured by multilateralism and international law. They built institutions that tried to be helpful. These institutions, in the views of people like Trump, were so helpful to the rest of the world, Trump felt it had become anti-American, which is a very contrasting view to how America viewed all of these institutions at the beginning. For those who, who might want to think about this in sort of economic history ways, Charles Kindleberger, the great economic historian, wrote about how the world needed 
hegemonic leadership. He formulated a theory, HST, hegemonic stability theory, that argued the world needed this kind of structure. It was a linear hierarchy. It was terribly undemocratic because no one outside of America ever voted for this leadership. It was an undemocratic, profoundly disturbing view of the world, but it did good in the world nonetheless. It did good in a way that is no longer tenable, both from inside and outside. So I've got 15 minutes left. Let me now take through the last part of this lecture, because I want to argue that the world that had been built, in my view, in the data that I presented very quickly, was a good world. It brought all of us out of the depths of poverty. It gave the poor of the world the beginnings of a control over their own destiny, despite all of it being ruled from a transatlantic center. It gave hundreds of millions of people in East and South Asia a lift out of extreme poverty. But it's no longer tenable. Now, for those, I have, I have good friends who are left-leaning development economists who profoundly object to the picture that I just drew. They say it did nothing of the kind. We need to undermine it. And I'll say, yes, but you know what? Your work is already being done for you because America itself is already undermining that system. America itself, the traditional unipolar center, feels that the world that they've constructed, this world system that they've constructed, has led to unintended, unexpected consequences, one of which is the right, dramatic rise of China. China is not a democracy. China's rise is, in America's view, a threat to America itself. And in the justly famous now Thucydides trap set of writings, there's a view that America will no longer tolerate the maintenance of this system, which has brought about the rise of China. America is undermining the system that it built, even though what it talks about is that China is undermining the international system. In one interpretation, China has no problems with the international system. It quite likes it, actually, because it's what allowed China to, to export its manufacturing. It's what allowed China to lift 600 million people out of poverty. China quite likes that international marketplace. It's not undermining the system. Regardless who's undermining the system, it is sitting in a hazardous place. And of course, in American political science, there is a view by John Mearsheim and others that this was inevitable because as great powers rise, they will always go to war. And for that, the evidence that they see, ships and missiles, South China Sea, as, as, the, as your director referred to, uh, China's ready to challenge the U.S. Navy in the Pacific. Despite what America might say, it's there not to, 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 to incite a war, but to, to preserve freedom of navigation, despite what China might say, that it too wants freedom of navigation, there are these dangers that are threatening the international system. Now, coming towards the end of my talk, remember I promised that I'm an economist by training. Many of you in the audience are. Dr. Malik is an economist. So what we wanted to do is to think about, well, what does economics have to say about all this? Because you see, the picture that I've just drawn the early part, the part about how the international system brought along development in so much of the world, yeah, there was economics there. But this thing about the Thucydides trap, America and China going to war, geopolitical rivalry, that's international relations. That's not something that economists typically get into. Well, here's where I want to change that intellectual narrative. I want to argue that economists should get into that and that we have a very important role to play in pulling the world back from the Thucydides trap. So I do that in a sequence of steps. First, I say the international system is not just great power geopolitics. It's not just about the number one and the number two in the vertical hierarchy, fighting it out and then imposing what the outcome is on the rest of the world. I want to argue that. But it turns out that position is not a very popular one. It turns out that most scholars who think about geopolitics 
think that it really is just number one and number two. It really is just the great powers, or sometimes it's number three and number four put in with, you know, uh, five eyes, free and open Indo-Pacific, all being alliances that that come around the geostrategic competition between number one and number two. Be- that view is actually quite entrenched. Kenneth Waltz, the great Harvard professor of, polit- of, of our international relations, said, it is wishful thinking to think that anyone outside of the great powers could actually influence world order. He says it would be ridiculous to think about international politics based on the Malaysia or the Costa Ricas of the world, because that's not how the international system works. And our good friend Thucydides, who had that trap, he also he wrote about things other than that trap as well, you know, because the Thucydides trap is about how Athens and Sparta in the Peloponnesian War, one was a hegemon, the other was a rising power, and then they eventually went to war with each other. That is what people think about as the Thucydides trap. And that's what Thucydides, for good or bad, is so well known for. But actually, he wrote other things as well. One of the things he wrote very much agrees with Kenneth Waltz. He wrote, the strong do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must. The number one and number two, and then possibly with number three and number four in an alliance around them, they fight it out. And then like the poor mouse deer in a Southeast Asian forest, the elephants fight it out, and then the mouse deer and all the other animals simply have to go along with what happened between the great powers, the elephants. And I want to contrast this political philosophy with a different political philosophy, which is given in the second box in this slide. And it's one that says, don't confuse killing for politics. Don't think that when these missiles and navies go out and and fight with each other over the South China Sea or whatever, that that is what politics is. Politics is about bringing people along with you. And military security conflict is not the same as politics. Put succinctly, don't confuse killing for politics. Actually, I stole this, don't confuse killing for politics, from another, you know, like Thucydides, great historical figure. That figure was Tyrion Lannister in Game of Thrones. He was, of course, a fictional character. But in the midst of the Mad Queen laying, you know, kill, you know, killing hundreds of people with her dragons, and the Lannisters, you know, sort of seeking total annihilation of the enemy. Well, this is what uh, Tyrion Lannister said: "Don't confuse what you're doing there for actual politics. Don't confuse international security for world order." So, where do you and I? Where do I come in with economics? Well, here goes back to a picture that we had seen earlier. If the world were a democracy, this circle is where it ought to be making decisions of global significance. Now remember, democracy does not ask for the color of a person's skin being the same as someone else's. It does not ask that their views be the same as mine. It says there's a level playing field where all of humanity counts, each member of humanity counts the same. So it's here that we should be exercising agency on how the international system evolves, not just through great powers. So you see, I've come back full circle to what I began the lecture with. I said that the way history worked is to think about the world as a linear hierarchy of nations. The way I want us to think about it is the third diagram at the bottom here, which is that there's a supply of alternative leadership the great powers, and then there's everybody else on the demand side who will be thinking, manipulating, acting, cajoling, nudging the great powers to do the right thing in a marketplace demand and supply way. Now, if Kenneth Waltz were here, he would say that's nonsense because the supply side should determine everything. Let me say that's not the case. And the way I'm going to do that, the way I'm going to finish out the the seven minutes of the talk that I've got is, this is how supply and demand is supposed to work. Just as a technical point, the fact that 
that is, yeah. uh, you know, it's just one commodity. It's not critical. You can draw the supply and demand curve in as many dimensions as you wish. But when you think about supply and demand, then Perhaps on the demand side, we begin yeah, to think. Yeah, Hello? Professor Danny, you can, you can take your time. Oh, okay. I wanted that to no, be a good time for no, Q&A. No, 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 yeah, Thank you very much. I, I won't take too much time because, you know, it's 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 not a great deal of fun to just listen to a lecture. You know, you want to jump in. So I want to let people jump in. But um, le let me let me go through 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 my point here about what we can do as demand. Now, remember when I began this, I said I would like to know what you think of this structure that I'm building. So one of the sharp points that I want us to think about is, does India think of itself on the supply side? or on the demand side? Because on the one hand, you, India is a nuclear power. 1.3, if not 1.4 billion people. A huge footprint, massive intellectual achievements, engineering achievements, technological prowess. You could well be a great power that's providing leadership in the world. Or alternatively, you might say my per capita income is not quite as high yet. There are many things I want the rest of the world to, to continue. I want to be able to continue to draw from the goodwill of the rest of the world. I have seen how you know, China's rise in income means it's no longer considered an emerging economy. And America is saying, well, if China is not an emerging economy, it will no longer draw special treatment from the World Trade Organization and other trade agreements. So there's a real trade-off to think about India, Singapore, any nation, do we want to think of ourselves as on the supply side or demand side? But let me tell the story. If we are on the demand side, because Singapore is a small nation, uh, it's got only a very limited military capability, it's not about defending the rest of the world, what would we be looking for on the other side of the market? What would we be want to look for? What should world order supply to us? What do we want? Well, on the left side of this slide, I've written down four things, and you might agree or disagree, you might want to add to them. I want the provider of world order, I want a leader of the world to supply global public goods. I want it to be, if need be, when there's a global recession, to be the consumer of last resort. I want it to be able to pump out liquidity into the markets and lift everyone. I wanted to supply global public goods. I wanted to provide security to small nations that are being bullied around. I wanted to take a leadership role on combating global climate change. I wanted to supply global public goods. I wanted to take leadership on breaking down uh, you know, the barriers to a vaccine against COVID-19 and then supplying COVID-19 at reasonable, affordable prices to the rest of the world, which the economics of the COVID-19 vaccine says it should be able to do. I want leadership to supply global public goods, and we're on the demand side. It's up to us to tell the supply side that's what we want. We say back in the old days, when we weren't thinking about marketplace, but when it was simply just a vertical hierarchy, America did do a lot of these things. If it's not America, if America is not interested in doing that, I want someone else to do that because great nations should be able to do that. Providing global public goods is a tiny fraction of their national income. It does a huge amount of good in the world. I want the, the supplier of world order to be a trusted source and will maintain a level playing field. I want it to protect small nations from bigger ones that might bully it. I want it to protect big nations from small ones that are trying to take advantage of it. I want there to be a level playing field. I want the supplier to be a capable nation. I want if there's COVID-19 pandemic in the world or if there's a global recession, I want to be able to look at the supply side and say, I'm going to learn from you because you are providing best practice examples to emulate because you are confident and you're able to deliver to your people. The way in which you deliver to your people, you, the way in which you attract consent of the governed is that you actually, you are a, a nation whose government, whose public service does good things for the world, for its own people and also for the world. I want that left side to be among the characteristics when I look at providers. 
I don't want just the biggest army. I don't want the greatest number of nuclear weapons. I mean, that's important. That'll be part of my wish list further down. But these are my top four. And then as I look around the world, I think, well, you know, hmm, let's re-examine America and other nations that are potentially providers. Which of these nations have done well in the global financial crisis? America, in the decades running up to 2008, spent decades lecturing you lecturing me, lecturing all the rest of the world about our financial regulatory systems. None of us met with the high standards that America had. Well, those weren't exactly high standards. After all, we discovered with 2008, because we discovered in 2008 that America had allowed the world's largest housing market bubble to infest its housing, uh, its housing market. And when that bubble burst, the ensuing global financial crisis almost brought down the global economy. And what was worse than all that was that America started to blame the rest of the world for helping cause this. Remember Asian thrift, global savings glut? America, despite its being the one that actually sparked the global financial crisis, you know, told, began to tell a story that actually it was the fault of other nations in the world because they were saving too much. And all of the saving was flooding into America as cheap capital. And that's what brought about the bubble in the housing market. You know, no attention paid to what was happening to its regulators, to surveillance, to its beha the behavior of its financial institutions. And COVID-19, as a second example, has America you know, done really well in COVID-19? Well, there are two things to look at here. What's happened to its economy and what's happened, uh, not just its economy, but all others, everybody else who's in the game. And what's happened to the number of people who've died from COVID-19? Okay, all the world is in recession. We, we, we make no bones about that. No nation, with possible exception of one, no nation is actually uh, been able to, to do you know, satisfactorily coming out of, you know, whether in the COVID-19 pandemic for their economy or coming out of it. The, you know, the entire world is in recession. The entire world switched around from 3% growth to now minus 4.5% for the whole global economy. And when you look around the world, every nation pretty much is in negative growth territory. America minus 4.3, Germany minus 6.0, United Kingdom minus 6.0. Even Singapore, the very careful, pr prudent manager of the economy, we're facing a minus 6.0 uh, change in the economy over 2020. All nations have suffered that. America, in one month, April 2020, saw its unemployment rate spiked by 20 million taking America's unemployment rate from the lowest it had been in 50 years to the highest it had been in nine decades. Everybody has suffered from this. But then as we look across COVID-19, we think, okay, you know what? Nations, and they were trying to manage COVID-19, they're worrying about how a lockdown, which would save us from COVID-19 infections, would damage the economy. So nations were trying to think of a trade-off. How much lockdown should I do compared to how much I should allow my economy to grow? Well, America has suffered from minus 4.3% growth. So whatever they did with COVID-19, I'm keen to see. So we look around the world. China has had three deaths from COVID-19 per million. And whether you believe those numbers or not, most observations are it's got very low accumulated deaths given its large population. New Zealand, minus five. Singapore, minus five. America, no, sorry, let me restate that. New Zealand, 5.2 deaths per million. Singapore, 5.0 deaths per million. China, 3.0 deaths per million. America, 890 deaths per million. India has done somewhere in between, about 100 deaths per million. America has not shown itself well as being able to manage, it's not delivered performance legitimacy. And then finally, my last point here, America now is complaining about being unable to compete in an international marketplace instead of using 
the, the rigors of international competition to make its, its economy, its industries more competitive. It is complaining about unfair competition. This is not what we look for in a leader. So what should we do? So I'm, I've, I've run out of my time. I know, Dr. Malik, you're very kind to say I can have a few more minutes. But let me, let me if I may, then just take three, you know, a few more minutes to finish up. Because remember, I've said this is what we should look for. This is what we are not finding. But is there actually any evidence? Am I just, you know, pretending that Kenneth Waltz is, is incorrect? So my last bit of my talk is to describe how actually in history, there actually is a lot of evidence that small nations have been able to influence the great powers. Okay, so Nicaragua versus the United States. America invaded Nicaragua in 1978. Nicaragua took America to the International Court of Justice. The ICJ found in favor of Nicaragua. America said, we don't care. We are a great power. We don't care what International Court of Justice or small nations like Nicaragua thinks. But then two years after that, America's behavior towards Nicaragua changed. It became friendlier, it provided aid towards Nicaragua. Singapore, where I sit, uh, is known as a nation that's very small, but that through clever diplomacy, through performance legitimacy, through uh, you know uh, showing that it's got teeth, has been able to exercise agency, has been able to influence how the great nations uh, uh, behave. Also, Singapore has leveraged a multiplier effect using platforms like ASEAN and the Forum of Small States, the same way that all of us in South and Southeast Asia and East Asia are building alliances. RCEP, which the director mentioned, is one example of that. I'm very sad. I mean, I know India made its deliberations and calculations, but RCEP would have been so much better if we had been able to convince India to come be part of it. Cuba, an example of a small nation, actually spurned both the United States and the Soviet Union it, it defied the Soviet Union for when the Soviet Union insisted that it not try to ex export revolution into the United States hemisphere, Cuba went and did that anyway. It defied the United States when the United States invaded it, and it began to build an alliance within Central and South America. It partnered with Venezuela. It withstood a U.S. embargo for half a century. So as we look around the world, you know, Saudi Arabia is an example, country X, country X, whichever country it is, there's a growing list of examples. I hope that you will then begin to tell me about other examples that you are familiar with and uh, that you like. What have I done? In this talk, I've told you about the international system. I told you about why it's collapsing. COVID-19 is just one example that is collapsing. It's something that many observers feel is appropriate. I think it's regrettable, but be that as it may, it's collapsing and there's no longer a choice about whether to keep that. I've told you about the arc and the outcome of why uh, I think what I do about the, the previous system, but that's okay because all of us are now agreed about the need for the new system. And I've told you about how the new system needs to bring in economic ideas so that the new system is responsive to what those who are not in the central part, not in the core of the international system, have ideas to bring. Uh, whether it's in terms of regulation, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, information technology, all the rest of us who are not in the, the core of the system have important ideas to bring. And that concludes my lecture. I've told you about economics and the international system. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to our question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Danu, for the interesting and insightful presentation on economics and international system, covering a wide range of issues. And mainly, it is based on your research, the past studies, as well as ongoing research studies. As you say, there are a number of questions raised by the participants during the resistance. Thank you, Doctor. I have, uh, I have I have summarized these questions in several. So here is the past questions relating to research that as you mentioned that uh, after eight years of negotiations, 15 Asia Pacific 
nations, including 10 ASEAN mem members and their six trade partners, including Australia, China, Japan, South Korea, and New Zealand, have signed the reset, which is held also as one of the biggest like, three trade uh, that deals in the history. Well, so however, India has opted out because of mainly the expectation that the influx of manufacturing and electronic imports from China and dairy products from Australia and New Zealand would harm the domestic producers. That was, I think, one concern. As you are a proponent of strong global economic integration, so what's your take on harmful effect or benefit of opting out research for India, whereas the Peterson Institute of International Economics that estimated that research member will be benefited significantly. And the, and the uh, another question, the related question, that is, and what is your expectation whether there's also what you have mentioned in your talk? So what is your expectation whether there is any possibility of India joining RISEP in the future? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malik. These are excellent questions and I've been worrying a lot about them as well. So let me make some, some general observations. I don't know that I, I can answer with specifics because, you know, the... The critical thing is India exercised choice. It had the it had the possibility of being continuing to be part of RCEP because India was part of the RCEP discussions for a very long time. And then almost at the last minute, it said, okay, I'm gonna come out. India exercised choice and it made its calculations. And I'm sure those calculations are very rational ones that involved, you know, the damage to, to the domestic economy versus the competition and the growth and what happens to consumer. All of that is something for India itself to work out. I can only talk about what looks like from the outside. I can talk about what's happening from the outside. So let me make a number of points. First is that, as you say, RCEP is, you know, 30% of the world economy. It is the world's largest trade grouping. All of that is right. And it will, it's not a perfect trade grouping. America objects to it because they say, America says, oh, low standards, you know, low standards. Well, yeah, but, you know, low standards are better than no standards because if you don't have anything, then you don't have anything, right? So, so it would be great if, you know, America could come in and, and exercise its wisdom, but it doesn't want to do that. So that's not available to us. Fine, it's low standards. It will still ignite trade and growth in a number of the constituent economies. In some states, it won't make a huge difference, but in many, it will. Perhaps the most critical thing is it gets nations talking to one another in a friendlier, collaborative, cooperative way. So like Singapore, I suspect Singapore, Singapore has been a very important part of the key group or, uh, arguing for RCEP. Singapore already has a lot of trade agreements with a lot of nations. How much more will this difference make? Probably not huge, but it will be important for Singapore to be part of that conversation. So Singapore is in it. And as the conversation builds, we will continue to get better and better understanding across nations. My second point is, although there is a view that RCEP is China-driven, the same way that TPP was America-driven, most of us in ASEAN say no such thing. <laughs> because for most of us in ASEAN recognize that actually it was ASEAN that was driving RCEP. You know, China cannot help but be consequential in anything it joins, the same way that India would be in exactly the same position. The two of you are nations with 1.3 billion people each. Anything that you go into, you will already have huge influence. You know, China is not central in RCEP. ASEAN is. A lot of the work that's been done in terms of writing the rules, the standards, all that came from the ASEAN secretariat. So I just need to make that point uh, because it should not be viewed as the reason I don't want to go into RCEP is because it's, it's dominated by China. It's not. It's China is one of the groups in here. But more important, if you don't want a grouping to be dominated by China, you come in. You know, America, if America does not want RCEP to be dominated by China, RCEP wants to welcome America into it. There's no, you know, closing off to anybody. If India wants to join, by all means, come on in. Uh, 
one of the things to one of the points to make about uh, low standards, which the Americans complain about. Okay, so let's let's think a little bit about this. What does high standards mean? Remember, in the TPP as originally construed, TPP pre-Trump was going to be a very powerful trade grouping, but it only had four ASEAN countries in it. And when you think about that four, it's a very peculiar four. It's Singapore, it's Malaysia, it's Vietnam, it's Brunei. I mean, this is not a natural, this is not ASEAN's largest economies. It didn't include Indonesia, it didn't include Thailand. This is a group of nations that were um, willing to go along with what America insisted for intellectual property rights, for high standards, and they were willing to take the pain because of the political calculation they would benefit from an alliance with America. Many nations, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Indonesia, chose not to go into TPP because the high standards would have meant that their industry, their workers, would have been damaged by that. High standards would have meant that many of their businesses would no longer be viable. So not having high standards is actually not necessarily a bad thing. It allows what many Latin American countries think of as special and differential treatment that would make it friendlier to get into. So I think RCEP is actually a very good deal. But obviously, again, I cannot speak for the calculations inside India. India has made its, its decision and, 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 and more power to India for, for that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dan. So well, now, first of all, you have mentioned about geopolitics and international economic relations. Now the question is based on that, that we know the relationship of USA, EU, and UK with Russia. And also the relationship of USA, Australia, and Japan with China. Well, so however, in the recent um, in the recent months, the data shows that USA is the largest importer of Chinese products, and China is the largest importer of USA as well. Similarly, the trade between Australia and China is very strong in the recent months. Yeah. So, so what's your take on the relationship between geopolitics? and international economic relations? <laughs> that's a that's the trillion dollar question. You know, this, this is a very classical question, of course. It goes all the way back to the great philosophers of, you know, the medieval era. Immanuel Kant, this is sometimes known as the, you know, is related to a Kant hypothesis that certain kinds of relationships between nations tie them closely together and they would not then go to war. Uh, democracy was one idea, but trade was another. And having McDonald's restaurants was a third, thanks to our friend Tom Friedman. But the, you know, the, this this is a wonderful idea. So it was related to how is it sensible to think that America and China could decouple? Is it actually sensible to think about that? Because America, I mean, under Trump, America's view was uh, China is cheating and we don't want to trade with China anymore. We will slap tariffs on China. And that has led to a spiral downwards to a terrible argument. Australia and China as well, as you described. So this is all very harmful, and it's harmful to all the nations concerned. Australia is, you know, because the, the trade challenges between Australia and China, my efforts seem to be just about wine and state, but it's also showing up in higher education, showing up flows of finance from students between the two nations. And my worry is that the instant you set, the instant you shut off the flow of scholars and students, that is a very bad way for nations to start growing ever further apart. One reasons that over the last 30 years was that actually the very first agreement between America and China was not about soya bean, was not about cars, was not about iPhones. It was about the exchange of students and scholars. The very first thing that Jimmy Carter and Teng Xiaoping signed was an agreement that China could send students and scholars to the United States. And what did America get out of it? America got to have an enemy nation state see how it worked see how democracy is supposed to work, to buy into the idea that this was a successful system. And it worked. It worked for so many decades. 
So this shutoff of trade is very uh, is very dangerous for many, many different reasons. Whether it's physically possible for America and China to decouple, probably not. But in their attempts to do so, they will inflict harm on each other. Will America and China be able to have their technology, you know, implicit in your question, Dr. Malik, it's also the technology one. Will America and China's technological systems bifurcate, splinter net? That is more probable. And again, that will be very harmful. And if that happens, it could well be that the world splinters, not just into a U.S. system and a China system, but also a European system. A European system that takes a different attitude on data ownership than is apparent in India, in Asia, in China, in the United States. So we could be facing, once once you begin to open that, that splintering of the internet, we could see a very damaging splintering all over the world. And people will think, yeah, it's okay, I can do that. I don't have to go to Google and search every time. I don't need to use the Android system. I don't need to be able to get on the iPhone app store. But once that actually settles in and we start recreating our own versions of that, it will be very damaging to the way technology progresses, technology advances. So back to you, Dr. Malik, please. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. <clears throat> so also, like uh, we have discussed about Trump and the changing global political leadership, right? So we have seen the economic policy of Trump, as you mentioned. Trump, the, yeah. yeah. the president of USA. I think it is kind of, as you mentioned, it is kind of inward looking policy. Like in India, we have Make in India campaign. That is similarly, Trump has been giving emphasis on American products, investment, arms, and employment under the campaign of Make America Great Again, right? So what's your expectation from Biden, the president-elect of USA Congress? So do you think there will be change in economic and trade policies which The IMF chief economist Gita Gubner is urging Congress to quickly pass a COVID-19 relief spending bill. So that is time of the essence. Okay. Over to Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. So many different sides to it. First, actually, I might surprise people. I think it's not a bad thing to have a little bit of make America great again, made in India. You know, I think it's good actually to have a little bit of that. And we learned this from the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, COVID-19 pandemic, global supply chains were all disrupted. Everybody was asking, where are we going to get toilet paper? Where are we going to get, you know, masks? And we realized that, you know, you couldn't just rely on a global supply chain that was stretched to such efficiency, but also so fragile. We needed to build a lot of, bit of resilience. And so MAGA made in India, you know, similar things elsewhere. China's dual circulation system, what he calls the DCS, the dual circulation system. All of these are very sensible. All of this is very good. But we need a happy medium. We need a way to balance that off. And every country is going to have to choose what works for itself. Okay? So in terms of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, robotics, you know, a lot, of, a lot of nations around the world are saying, and 5G technology, a lot of nations around the world are saying, well, these are really important technologies of the future. I want to use the best of them, but I also have to be realistic about their security concerns. I don't want a potentially enemy or unfriendly nation state to have all of my secrets. And I think it's appropriate that we all be cautious in this way. And when we're cautious, we also recognize America is no saint in this regard. America has Act 702 of the Foreign International uh, Foreign uh, Intelligence Surveillance Act. And FISA, excellent. America likes to come across as saying, well, you have to watch out for Huawei and the Chinese Communist Party because they will take all your secrets. America actually, through uh, the Spectrum operation that was revealed uh, by, you know, by, by very, you know, very glad, in a very high profile way, the, the PRISM PRISM, the PRISM's project within America's Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, allows America to look at all of our data. So all of us here 
were foreigners in the U.S. Whenever our data goes through U.S. networks, America can look at all of that. And it doesn't have to tell anybody else. It doesn't have to tell us. So America is just as dirty in all of this. All of this is to say we should all be careful. We should all be careful about, about this. We should all be careful about resilience. We should all be careful about our, our security. All of that is right. So I'm, I'm all for that. But we can't shut ourselves off completely either. So I would argue for a little bit of, of, uh, of global engagement. Even if America shuts down, it needs to, to deal with the rest of the world. That will be a good thing for everyone. America can't go back to the way it was for most of the last 300 years. And then finally, let me turn to the Trump question, because that's where you began. I think that there's a great hope that Trump, since he's no longer going to be president, it's just a bad memory, right? You know, after Trump has gone away, you know, all nations should be nationalistic a bit, not to the extreme of Trump. And that will be a bad memory. My fear is that that will not happen, actually. And there are a number of reasons why I say that. More people voted for Trump in 2020 than the number of people who voted for Trump in 2016. If you look at just the, the number of people's votes, you might say America is even more in love with Trump. After all that Trump did disrupting the world, Americans are actually quite happy with Trump. You know, it's just that more people voted for Biden than voted for Trump. But Trump had 74 million Americans on his side. So Trump will never actually really go away at this point. Trump and Trumpism will be there in America for a long time. In fact, I worry that Biden himself has a bit of Trumpism in him. Because remember, the Democrats are, are very suspicious of dealing with the Amer Democrats in America are suspicious of dealing with the world. They're suspicious of too much international engagement, certainly on economic front. Uh, they're quite happy being sort of more, more, you know, sort of autarky and being more protectionist. So that side of Trump will remain. But Biden will also know that America, the mood in America has changed. The mood might have been, you know, let's go out in the world and, and transform it in our own image under Was George Bush under Bill Clinton, but George W. Bush, Barack Obama, America. Let's look after our sector. So Biden will have to respect that. It's a democracy. He will have to respect that. That 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 view of the people. So I'm I'm you know what Biden will do. He will remove the additional randomness that Trump seemed to inject into everything. Yeah. Trump seemed to be willing to be random. Biden will be more willing to negotiate with many things, with India, with Singapore, with China, in a way that Trump did not. But will we go back to, you know, sort of the American vision the, of, of old, the liberal internationalism? My suspicion is no. Back to you, Dr. Malik. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Like, you, we have been discussing that the notion of anti-globalism has been emerging after the war. It could from USA, Europe, within Asia, Africa, and Australia, particularly their protest against some country's method of business investment trade. Well, and also listen to GVCs, like the new policies, it's very challenging. So the question is whether the international system has enough scope to address these problems. So do you have any suggestions as regard to like yeah. law, policy, changes, strategy, yeah. for instance? For instance, if a large economy or organization like make huge investment on the small countries like Sri Lanka or African countries like Kenya, so they face huge problems due to due, um, with regard to stabilization of the country and their policy and interest due to the mounting pressure, debt pressure. Right. Whereas in case of EU, European countries, the small country may not face such problems. Um, as EU intervenes and protect them. So, like, what's your take? I think we need to continue to rely on international rule of law, and we need to strengthen our multilateral institutions, World Trade Organization, World Health Organization. We need to make those, well, first, we need to make those more inclusive, because, you know, I said earlier that they've worked, 
in the main, but there's no question they are Western dominated. First, we need to change that, make them more inclusive, and then we need to strengthen them. One of the things that, that we learned from this last round with the World Health Organization, I'm actually a fan of the WHO. I think that they did the right mm. thing, but they were criticized from so many different sides. Their range of operations was severely restricted, curtailed. They were not as effective. So I think that's very dangerous. And I think World Trade Organization, you know, as you know, Donald Trump's administration has basically removed the possibility that the WTO could adjudicate on the kinds of investment issues that, that you've described. There will always be problems. You know, we have to respect national sovereignty at the same time that we need to respect uh, private property rights, that, and sometimes those are in conflict, and we'll need to work those out. But we need a strong institution like the WTO, and we need to rebuild all of those. Well, thank you. Back to you, let's, please. Yeah. Let's, let's move to the issue on related to future global economy. So we know that, that forecasting, based on various assumptions and hypotheses, particularly in the long run, particularly in the long run, and even in the medium term, the forecasting error could be could be high. That we know as an economist, as an econometrician. The, many of the reputed organizations fail to make the prediction, even in the short term, particularly if there is any surprises or external force like COVID-19. Right. So, for instance, in India, all these agencies, including Reserve Bank of India, to predict the quarter two GDP growth, that is, uh, uh, they predicted. This prediction ranges from like minus again for the quarter two of the minus 8.5 percent to minus 13 percent. Wow, even my, yeah, even myself and also Dr. Somikant Ghos, our wow. advisor, so we are involved and provided prediction from SBA that the figure could be minus 10.7 percent. For the actual estimate, which provided by Central Statistical Organization India, it's about minus 7.5 percent. Mm. Why? Because some surprises like the performance of manufacturing sector, we didn't expect. So that manufacturing sector providing that uh, performed. So though, like, though it is a debatable sort of debate issues, there is opposite correlation between an index of industrial man product of manufacturing and a manufacturing GDP, which could also be because of, uh, uh, there's a huge size of informal economy, which like very difficult to measure and capture in the estimation. Yeah. That's uh, the yeah. Yeah. And uh, also, this is predicted that the GDP growth of this year, for in case of India, it will be about minus 7.1 percent, oh. and the next year it will be huge, 10 percent. Then in 2022 it will be 22 percent. So with this backdrop, so where we can see India and China in the global economy in 2030? Wow, that's really interesting. I I had seen the IMF forecast as well for India, uh, which was about minus 10. But I, you know, they hadn't done the kind of work that you've done, which is sort of, you know, what happens after that. And so plus 10, plus 20, that's wonderful. You know, one of the things that I, um, that I had done previously and that I showed was the shift of the world's economic center of gravity towards the east, towards us, basically. And taking the, I am firmly convinced that the center of gravity will be between India and China. It will be firmly here. And both of these uh, great nations will need to sort of work out how, we, how, how it engages one with the other. Because remember, it's like, you know, the two elephants and we want, we in Singapore want everything to be friendly. We know that there are, there are tensions. We know that, you know, the, there have been some, some troubles in the last few months. But we want there to be a, an understanding that is actually mutually respectful and allows the ongoing development to continue. I think that having an, a, you know, if, if India's economy does do as you say, you know, right now it's going to go down minus 10, minus 8 or minus 10. But 2021, 2022, a rebound of 10. And then after that 20 percent, they'll be good. It'll bring us back to trend growth. And then, you know, with the heavy footprint of 1.3 billion people and the continued strength in, um, in technology, information technology, but also all kinds of other technologies, um, India will be well poised. And this will really be the Asian century. So I'm very optimistic, very optimistic for that. 
Yeah. So thank you. So this is the. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we'll go for the last questions from the participants, ah. which, uh, which they have put in the registration. So we'll take another one, two questions from who directly from the participants. Okay. So considering the debate on the like nature of economic recovery, that is, it could be, as you know, that it could be V-shaped or W-shaped or U-shaped and K-shaped. So what do you think about developing, emerging and developing and developed economy and global economic, global economic recovery? And also about the Asian economy. So, what kind of step to be taken for that economic recovery? So yeah. Do you have any? Yeah. Well, just just a couple of quick thoughts here. Actually, you know, the uh, one of the sort of remarkable things looking at COVID nineteen is that the rich countries like the United States and Western Europe, the UK, have actually done terribly. They've done terribly. You know, either their science got messed up or they messed up on their restrictions, messed up on their sanctions to get people under control. But something has gone very profoundly wrong there. The emerging nations have done relatively well. I mean, you know, some nations have been very struck by it. But many emerging nations, many poorer nations have been able to keep COVID-19 more under control. Now, very sadly, that's also come about when a lot of these nations have gone heavily into debt. So my worry is that despite this abysmal performance by the rich countries, they will simply print money to get out of to get out of the the difficulties they're in, economic difficulties that they're in. No one's been made to to pay the price, and for emerging nations that have gone into debt, a lot of our debt is foreign denominated, and we will have to work really hard to overcome that. Despite how you know we've actually done we've already worked hard at containing COVID-19. So it, it could well be that, you know, the world is going to, uh, the emerging world is going to be in for quite a hard time from this. But I think that if we are able to to get together, make kind of sensible swap arrangements, uh, make sensible, so mutually beneficial economic policies ahead, that will be very good for, for all the world. Uh, and it will also make even clearer that, you know, the traditional global economic leadership is just no longer in charge. It's really abandoned the rest of us. Okay. So, thank you. We'll take the last questions. And this okay. is not, that is not the last question. So, one participant, he's responding to your uh, your, like, your issues, which you raised, like what is India, whether it is focusing on supply side or demand side. Let me just read out. So, uh, Professor Kwa, Kwa, going by your model of supply demand, gravity, I think it is time for India to the supply side. The current regime's focus has been towards the self-reliant India. So I think India has all the potentials. For example, in the post-COVID world, where we are on the brink, brink of vaccinating a huge population in the world, India has the required capacity to fulfill the huge demand of the upcoming vaccines. So this is just a comment. That's a wonderful, so, wonderful comment. Wonderful comment. Congratulations to whoever it was. It was it's a wonderful yeah. comment. Very, yeah. very spot on. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. For this, this Dr. Not, I'm having yeah. one last question to yeah. yeah. Uh, director, good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great thing, but just I have got one question. I know the time has increased, but I couldn't resist myself. But it's nothing to do with economics. I've got something vibrant. The way you presented, one thing you talked about, Woodrow Wilson, Richard Nixon, and other president. Although they were not popular, still you remember them, one. Second, regarding politics, he said, politics is nothing but bringing people together. Third, you talked about democracy, you said, the democracy doesn't look on the color of the skin. Now my question is, minus economy, whether it's rule of the law, freedom of speech, independent judiciary is going to make a defined so far as economic is concerned in the long run? Um, the quick answer is that I do think the criteria by which we will need to run our economies run our, our nations going forwards, will rely on those things that you said, independent judiciary, independent media, checks and balances, a level playing field generally, transparency, clear rules, uh, infrastructure, all of these things will matter. Whether we take that last step 
and attract consent of the governed through the vagaries of the ballot box, that I'm less, uh, th that I, I see it in less black and white. I think that it's very important that people be able to express their political voice, but I also appreciate that sometimes when people express their political voice, the outcome is very peculiar. Brexit is one such example. Where I think Britain has really damaged itself by coming out of one of the world's most successful collections. Uh, those presidents that I described, Woodrow Wilson, um, Harry Truman, Richard Nixon, none of them were particularly popular. Woodrow Wilson could not get his idea for the League of Nations past his own government, past his own Congress. And I think that was a huge obstacle to the world building better bridges. Uh, and instead, you know, at the university that I went to as an undergraduate, you know, we used to have something called the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs that trained wonderful scholars and, and practitioners. We're no longer allowed to call it that because they say Woodrow Wilson was a racist. Harry Truman was also racist. His family was very close to the Ku Klux Klan, but through his vision for the world, he did amazing things. And Richard Nixon had deep, deep personal failings, deep personal failings. But he's also the one who reached out all the way across the world and brought China out of its angry isolation. So I think that, you know, we, I, I'm not suggesting that I know a way to replace the ballot box. I'm suggesting that we need to look at things other than just ballot box outcomes. Because when uh, Trump had challenged in the Supreme Court, that uh, Supreme Court has turned it down. Yep. So and, that's you know, yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> thank goodness. Yeah. Thank that you. is in context of China, actually, I was asking this. So that's all. Thank well, you. I mean, as you know, China will never uh, converge towards a ballot box kind of polity for a long time. Later on, way back, way out in the future, in my mind. But in the conceivable future, in the foreseeable future, it's going to be very far from that. It does, uh, it does have a middle class that's quite content. It is responsive. And so the Economist newspaper coined the term responsive authoritarianism. Yeah. That you could have na nation states with governments who are authoritarian and so could actually do a lot of harm, but actually responsive to the people. So I think of China today as a responsive authoritarian state. And there are still deep, deep failings, as with all our nations, with America, with, you know, every single nation. And I, I can also say that the Economist newspaper calls Singapore also a responsive authoritarian state. Oh, actually, leadership without change for a longer time. Yeah. Definitely it will go for some dysfunction, even if it is, goes in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your thank, those thank, views. Thank you. Thank, thank you so for, much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for participating and engaging. I mean, I, I'm really impressed. I'm so pleased. You stayed through all this time and then you continue to engage with me. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. So let me request Dr. Krishna Kumar, Dean SPL, to propose board of thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jagannath. Uh, this is Professor Krishna Kumar, the Dean of SPAL. Uh, uh, what a wonderful way you have taken forward the whole discussion. It was a good intellectual narrative on the theme of uh, economics and the international system. You argued it with uh, uh, the uh, world order, how the economics need to be perceived in the way things are going. And you started off uh, with how the hegemonic part of the uh, a post World War scenario evolved from starting from the Britain Wood Twins, the way how uh, uh, you know an IMF uh, can only be headed by an European and how an World Bank can only be headed by an American. And then you went on to discuss about how the economic agents have behaved uh, over the years. How we are veering towards what is called as perhaps the nation century as we see it. And um, you also explained in detail about the narrative of the historic arc. I liked it very much, the way things have evolved uh, when you look from the uh, public policy angle. And uh, uh, 
the way how uh, democracy uh, uh, especially from the leadership uh, in the marketplace when you look at how these historic uh, arc despite being the uh, you know uh, nemesis in so many other uh, connotations might uh, has actually provided america the uh, uh, vision to on the multilateralism front on our open trade front and the inclusive transparency it provided and things like that but unfortunately the same uh, uh, american century right now was not seen uh sustaining many of the uh, uh, you know uh, the, the globalization lift you know, which it provided once upon a time uh and you explained it with uh, you know uh, aspects like how the subprime in 2008 uh from the you know morass of the global economy us could not lift itself uh, the world up uh, in fact the uh, other enemy countries like uh, once upon enemy countries like japan and all had to lift much of the global economy and the how the uh, uh, hst theory is you know falling apart and slowly how the uh, us uh, interference and uh, you described it with the uh, thucydides trap and uh, the thucydides trap the way the, you know uh, how it is uh, devolving ultimately you say that supplier need to be a sub the world and in the capitalism and how the uh, it's not enough to be giving the wish list but the capacity to practice it and you know, how whichever who be the country which will replace the uh, american century we need to have those traits embedded in them and how the performance capability is going to be a major thing that will be looked up to whether it is by china or india or the asian century that we talk about and uh, your in lucid style uh, Uh, explained many of these things uh, gave a, a very good narrative to the whole uh, uh, talk, talk and uh, we fully appreciate it and i am sure that people who were, were tuned in from the bank and uh, from far far and wide have uh, hugely benefited from your discussion and you also in uh, with the abundant patience you explained all the questions uh, posed by dr jagannath and uh, including the last question by our director uh, so thank you sir thank you professor for the entire this one and uh, Really appreciate the way you've engaged the audience today, and uh, again, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Jagannath. You know, he used earlier brought in a lot of uh, economists, international speakers to the forum uh, to discuss on uh, demand side uh, issues, majorly and supply side uh, issues. The last time around, in fact, he also as a professor, I've been to pilot. Professor Pilot was the person last time from your own in US, and. Uh, Uh, now this time unfortunately he brought in uh, an expert from public policy and yeah, mm-hmm. i'm sure that they all of uh, the uh, people who tuned in and really benefited from this alternative perspective that you provided in the thing and uh, um, thank you uh, to our director also for the opening remarks he made unfortunately because of uh, want of other means uh, our chief economic advisor couldn't be here today and otherwise we would have been able to hear him as well uh, i saw in between he could tune in but i guess in the end he took the very because of his other big occupations he couldn't be joining uh thank you for all the participants who could uh, tune in and uh, so, uh, when, uh, we appreciate fully the engagements of ta- time you had benefited from these deliberations and uh, uh, you know we may not see many people here uh, there are a lot of people who work behind the scenes also on the technology front to put together a uh, discussion of this nature and uh, we really appreciate uh, their contributions uh, for the successful uh, conduct of this thank you thank you, thank you so much thank you, thank you so much let me let me request our, our director to give any remarks it's over to you sir yeah uh, professor uh, it's really learning manchani in the way you have uh, come through here is a really spontaneous uh, india is very fond of cricket you know it's like you're opening 100 now uh, you have just scored a century for us <laughs> <laughs> and i request um, dr jagannath um, find out his time some other topic also will stand in his Now, this platform is there for this we want eminent persons like you who can take it forward and again my uh, again my humble request for you whenever you come to india and kolkata we'll be there to t- take you forward and to ensure that you'll come, uh, visit our institute thank, thank you, you very so much, much yeah, it's a, a great learning and uh, great deliberation thank you very much thank, thank you, you dr so jagannath
Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Danny, for the time. Really, it is great to have an eminent economist like you on the board. Also, we are thankful to Professor Bajpayee for helping me to coordinate <laughs> with you. So I cannot <laughs> resist by without naming his, his name, without taking his name. So, Professor, I hope he's watching us. And thanks to your colleagues, Ms. Lee and Ms. Amira, for scheduling the meeting and all other coordination since the last about three months. So thank you so much. Uh, finally, thank all the attendees for coming over here. And also, I thank the SPL members being present here today. So thank you, Professor Kwa. She will, I hope probably see you sometime somewhere, either in Singapore or somewhere. Definitely. Thank you so see much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. Really good. Really enjoyed myself. Thank you very much.